And now your state game and fish department brings you Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is a public service feature prepared and presented to further acquaint Oklahomans with the state's wildlife resources, hunting and fishing, and the activities of the Oklahoma Game and Fish Department. Now Outdoor Oklahoma, with Orville Allard as your host. Hello there, and welcome to the Outdoor Oklahoma program. Well, Clay Wilson, one of our regional biologists, recently returned from California with a quantity of fingerling uh, striped bass which the Oklahoma Game and Fish Department has imported into the state for experimental purposes. And here to tell us about that project is Clay. Clay, what kind of fish are the striped bass? Well, the striped bass is a member of the true bass <coughs> family. Or, well, it's a, all you could almost say it's a brother to the white bass, which occurs naturally in Oklahoma. But the striped bass is, is a fish which lives in the estuaries of the sea and has a wide salt tolerance. It can live either in fresh water or in salt water with pretty high uh, salt content. We've, we've brought it here in the hopes that we can get it started in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what particular lakes do you hope to uh, propagate with these fish? Well, we're starting right now with two lakes, with the Great Salt Plains Reservoir and with Lake Murray. We put some fish in each lake and also we have some we're keeping over at Durant, <coughs> excuse me, at the hatchery at Durant, which we hope to be able to propagate over there. That way we have three chances of getting an original start of striped bass. In other words, if now exactly where did these fish come from? Well, the fish that we brought back came from the Tracy River in California. Actually, the striped bass is not native to the West Coast. It's native to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, where it is the most popular surf fish, and they have tremendous uh, surf fishing there in the fall and winter. It was uh, two small stockings of striped bass were introduced into the San Francisco Bay in 1881 and again in 1884. And those two stockings were sufficient to propagate the entire Pacific Ocean, so to speak. That uh, doesn't take very many. Now, in California, on the West Coast, they are game fish and are protected by law. There's no commercial fishing. There is a tremendous amount of sport fishing for them out there. In, uh, on the East Coast, on the other hand, uh, they are not a game fish, and commercial fishing for the striper on the East Coast is a large enterprise. And the fish that we got, we got through a cooperative endeavor between the, the, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Reclamation at Tracy, California, the U.S. Air Force, and the Game and Fish Department. And we brought them here. They were caught by the Bureau of Reclamation and the Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Tracy River near Tracy, California, it's south west of Sacramento, about 65 miles. Well, Clay, uh, tell us something about your trip to California and back with these fish. It is now approximately 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're loading the airplane. That's Captain Saturday, the public information officer at Ardmore Air Force Base, helping me get my parachute fitted. Uh, this airplane took off. We took off at approximately 5 o'clock from Ardmore Air Force Base, and the airplane that you see in the background, you'll see a better shot of there in just a minute, the C-119 flying boxcar. That's the crew chief uh, closing the front door and he get in the airplane from the back. It's approximately 1,500 miles from there to Mather Air Force Base near Sacramento, California, where we picked up the fish. We arrived out there 1 o'clock in the morning and it took us about uh, four hours to get the fish loaded and aboard the airplane and then of course uh, 1500 miles back to Ardmore. Well, while we were there, of course, the Bureau of Reclamation personnel met us with the fish at Mather Air Force Base and we loaded them during the night. Uh, there's the flying box car leaving Ardmore for Sacramento where we would pick up the fish from the Bureau of Reclamation Service. And now we're back arriving back in Ardmore after 20 hours with the fish aboard. Uh, we met in 
or more by personnel from the Game and Fish Department who will unload uh, approximately half of the fish. There's the, the truck from the Durant Fish Hatchery, the barrels on it, John Murphy driving the truck, and you can see the back of the airplane. We've taken the doors back and now unloading the striped bass from the airplane to the truck, and half of the fish that we're unloading there will be taken to Lake Murray, and half of them we will acclimate to fresh water. There you see a good picture of the striped bass, and there's a flounder, uh, ocean fish, that accidentally got in with the striped bass. These striped bass were taken out of the river. And uh, now the fish are on their way. Half of them are on their way to Lake Murray, and the other half we kept in a holding tank at Whitehurst Brothers in Ardmore, where we are taking the fish out of the salt water, running slowly over a period of days, running them slowly into fresh water so that they will be perfectly acclimated over a period of time to the kind of water that we will keep them in at the Durant Hatchery for a year or so, at which time we'll watch them and try to coach them. There are two game rangers uh, moving the fish, and now the fish are on the way to Lake Murray. We are, the airplane in the meanwhile, taking the rest of the fish to the Great Salt Plains Reservoir. And here, that's uh, Howard Sparter, the game ranger, and John Murphy, and there's Dutch Jacobs putting the striped bass into Lake Murray. Pretty long trip. Well, Clay, that must have been an interesting trip and an interesting experience for you. Yeah, well. Now, tell us something more about the life history and the habits of these striped bass. Well, the striped bass spawn almost the same as the white bass do, they, uh, with the exception that they have to have, as far as we know, quite a little bit of running water. They need shallow, fast water with gravel or rock bed. They're free spawners, just like the white bass. They'll migrate into fresh water, out of salt water in the spring, and deposit uh, the eggs there in the swift moving water, and then the eggs go ahead and float and sus are suspended partially and then they gradually settle to the bottom, and they hatch. Well, after they hatch, why then normally they'll move back into salt water. All the spawning takes place in fresh water. However, there is quite a little bit of evidence that has been collected in South Carolina and also in North Carolina and in California, which leads us to believe that there is a good possibility that we can produce a standing population of striped bass in at least some of the lakes in Oklahoma. Now, normally in natural uh, habitat, striped bass will mature, the female striped bass will mature when they're about four years old, the males when they're about two years old. Now, that's that's important from the fishing standpoint because that means certainly that it's going to be at least uh, four years before we'll be able to have an open season on striped bass in Oklahoma. Now in their native habitat, when the striped bass move back down into the uh, waters with higher salinity or more waters that have more salt in them, then they start to grow. When they're young, they live just like all young fishes. They live on plankton, which are small microscopic plants and animals in the water. After they reach fingerling size or perhaps a little larger, then they start taking uh, bottom organisms, uh, small crayfish, and begin to take other fish. And then when they get just a little bit longer, perhaps, oh, maybe five or six inches long, they're strictly fish eaters. That's also very important in as much as we hope that if they, we get a native population, they will help keep down the rough and forage fish problem that we have in our overpopulated lakes, particularly uh, with regard to the gizzard shed and to the drum. Now these fish grow to a tremendous size, and uh, in their native habitat, they're long lived. The American Museum of Natural History got a striped bass when it was only six inches long, kept it for 20 years, which time it died, and it weighed 30 pounds. Now, the record for the largest striped bass ever taken was taken commercially off the East Coast and weighed 150 pounds. Now, a lot of them are taken in the 10 to 20 to 30 pound class, both on the East Coast and on the West Coast. And uh, there's a lot of money, of course, spent for fishing tackle. They fish for them with lures, with live bait. On the East Coast, 
And it's a, it's a tremendous industry, both on the East Coast and West Coast. And of course, we'd, we'd like to see that in Oklahoma. I believe that. Clay, what are we doing to take care of these striped bass? Are they now protected by law or anything like that? No, they're not right now, but they will be. Um, we don't want people taking them. We have them in the lakes now, and we certainly don't want anybody taking them out until such a time, of course, as we declare, or the commission declares a season on them. Now, that's very important because it's going to be difficult for the average fisherman to tell the difference between the striped bass and the white bass. Well, how do you tell Well, I've got thing? it's going. It's awfully hard, even for an expert. I've got a white bass, mounted white bass, right here. And... If you look at it, you see these dorsal spines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's, there are eight of them. You, 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 can, uh, you can't see these two down here very, very good. Now, this is a white bass, the one that occurs naturally. The striped bass of a comparable size will look almost exactly like this fish, except there will only be five of these spines here, one, two, three, four, five. It's kind of like telling the difference between black and white crops. And another thing, the striped bass is a more elongate fish. In other words, it wouldn't have this, this, this extra stomach down here. It's, it's more elongate, and it has a little bit smaller eye, and their stripes are different, and there are several technical characters. But the main thing, if you, if you catch a fish that looks a little bit like a white bass, and yet it's, it's thinner and perhaps a little bit browner, and there's any question in your mind, the fishman should not take him. Just throwing back one fish more or less won't make much difference. And there are only two lakes which we have to worry about that right now, and that's Great Salt Plains Reservoir and Lake Murray. And if you're fishing either one of those reservoirs, please don't take anything that you think might be a striped bass because that might be the very one that will help uh, provide future stock for the rest of Oklahoma. Well, Clay, is there any other comment or anything else you'd like to discuss? Before we well, there are a couple of people I'd like to thank. This project was made possible bringing these striped bass to Oklahoma through the courtesy and cooperation of the two or three organizations, particularly the United States Air Force. The General Cecil H. Chidrick, commanding officer of the 63rd Troop Carrier Wing at Ardmore Air Force Base, was most generous. Without his help and cooperation, it would not have been possible. I just can't thank him enough. Bill McGayard, Daily Arden Wright, always helps us when the chips are down, and, and Bill always does a good job. And of course, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and all of our colleagues in the Game Fish Department who were there to help take care of the fish and to take care of them after we got back to Ardmore and to the Great Salt Plains. Without everybody's help, well, it just wouldn't have been possible, and I'm, I'm real proud of everybody, and I certainly do wish to thank again uh, the U.S. Air Force and General Childry at Ardmore. Well, Clay, and we want to thank you for telling us about this most interesting project. Well, folks, we'll be back with you again at the same time on the same station next week, and we hope you'll make it a point to be with us. Outdoor Oklahoma is a public service feature prepared and presented by the Oklahoma Game and Fish Department. Be with us at this same time next week when your state game and fish department again brings you Outdoor Oklahoma.